Okay, well, sorry about the whole music thing. <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm just going to get started. Um, please let me know if you are noticing any buffering or anything. Might possibly be an issue today. I don't know. Um, anyway, hi, I'm Morgan. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Um, this is my stream, Tempest Games. Um, and my sibling waits until just now to try and FaceTime me. Um, good job, Taylor. Thank you. <laughs> um, right. Uh, what was I saying? Um, so this is my stream Tempest Games, which is a world building TP TTRPGs and board game design, uh, stream. And, um, today's show is my, this is going to be my first world building stream, uh, world building show ever. Um, very excited about that. Um, we're gonna work on writing, um, a player's guide for my world. I thought that would make a really good introduction. Um, but uh, it's been a month since my intro. Um, I got a little bit ill. Um, was trying really hard not to think about the Rona. Um, and it went away after the weekend. But I had not had enough time to prep for the show. So I didn't want to push myself. Um, but uh, yeah, I've I've been having a lot of sleep problems on and off, not able to um get to sleep, not able to wake up. Um it hasn't been fun. Um I'm having a bit of brain fog. Um I may need to be reminded about things that I already know. <laughs> so just, you know, that'll happen. Um but uh yeah, how was your month? How's everybody been doing? Um, I've been, um, trying to make some switches to, oh, that's not right. I'm, I'm making a little cover cause I have some, I have some cider in a can here. Um, and, uh, rather than risk, I thought I'd take the opportunity, um, worrying about, um, possible being dis demonetized because of uh, product placement to um, use up some of my new craft paper that I got from Aldi a couple weeks ago. Um, <laughs> Thanks, HB. Uh, which, uh, which people that know me by uh by Morgan? Well, no, I just said it was Morgan. What am I talking about? Uh, do is are you a person that I know that I should call by name, or are you cool with HB? Yeah, Rick, I'm 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 in the Southwest. Uh, you've kind of it, obligatory uh cider drinking down here. Oh, Heather, of course, I remember. B Dubs. Durr. Um, thank you for joining, Heather. Yay. Um, I really see. Now, this is why um, I would struggle um, as a teacher. I am terrible at remembering names. Absolutely terrible. The only way that I've ever been able to been able to manage is it manage remembering people's names is if I if I try that trick where I sit there and I just go like look you in the eye while I'm talking to you and use your name a lot to like Heather 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 and that's always just felt super weird so I don't do that um and then I just don't remember people's names um that's how that goes let's see where'd my tape go there it is it does work it's just super weird um so let's see, what have I been up to this month? Um, I uh, have been trying to switch to some uh, no waste, waste free, whatever they call it, um, 
alternatives. I've been doing that for a while. Um, I managed to get a lot of my sort of cleaning stuff, like general household cleaning stuff, switched over to some like compostable materials. Um, I've got like cellulose sponges now and like a sisal brush for cleaning jars and things. Um, and, um, this month I managed to, uh, get, find some soap bars, some body soap bars and a, um, shampoo bar. And I'm trying those out and they seem all right so far. Um, um, and, uh, what else? Um, oh, I, I've also found a brand that does dental swaps. Um, so I'm trying out some um, Wild Peace Silk um, Dental Floss that comes in this really cute little glass tube with a little uh, screw-on metal cap that has a, a hook on it that you rip the floss with. That seems to be doing all right so far. And I'm trying out some um, mouthwash tablets. It's a brand called Jorganics. Spelt like George, but drop the E and it's organics from there. Or no, just annex. Jorganics. Yeah, that's it. Um, they're based in the UK. Uh, yeah, that's what that. Um, no, I can't think of anything else. Oh, no. Uh, George, my partner, um, it likes to chew on gum to keep him chewing on his nails. Um, and I got him some, they have some gum there as well. Xylitol sweetened, by the way, and here's my now nicely wrapped cider can so that you can't read it. <laughs> um, what else? What else? Um, the chewing gum and the nails thing. Yeah, that's, um, he relies on that pretty heavily. We've been buying a lot of chewing gum for him. Um, but it comes in a plastic tub, a brand called Spree, S-P-R-E-E. -E. Um, it only comes in like 1300 little tiny pieces of gum that you have to chew two of at a time to really feel substantial. Um, so I thought I'd switch, try this one, other one out because they, um, do massive, bags and refills um so hopefully that will bring down the cost a little bit even though we're going to a very specialist boutique brand type of gum um what else uh hmm D, D. um it's been a fun month um still a little sore at my dm he's been a little bit cruel this last month um uh that's you rick um but uh who <laughs> me so innocent you just yeah yeah um but uh obviously i won't i won't you know press because he's doing me a favor and he's moderating today so um uh, i'll be nice to my evil dm uh but we did some cool stuff um, see, uh, my one group, we charmed an ogre and, um, killed a bunch of goblins with that ogre. That was amusing. We all thought we were going to die. And then all of a sudden we had a giant friend who threatened to eat me. Um, and, uh, and let's see. Oh yeah. Hail Bone Crusher. Bone Crusher is brilliant. Um, <laughs> Uh, yesterday, unfortunately, the character that charmed the ogre died in combat and we all had to book the heck out of there because not only did we have a couple of kobolds trying to kill us, now we had an angry ogre. Um, that was fun. Uh, let's see. Yeah, um, our DM, uh, Rick, again, uh, uh distracted us with returning our long lost dog river to us um so that we would stand um in the middle of the premises we were trying to escape um allowing disguised self to drop on uh one of the party members um so next week tomorrow actually we have a fun 
little trying to escape out there with um, a character we have now dubbed Leomort because reasons. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. What else? Yes, the um, Edward dying was very sad. We were all a little bit shocked. Um, I'm playing the particularly naive character, so um, they didn't take it terribly well. Um, but they were um, set to invent adventuring by uh, their god, um, and so they uh, were quite stubborn about uh, continuing, um, even though some wanted to quit. Uh, yes, Heather, that would be amazing, seeing as you um, aren't working at the moment. Unless you do manage to get a job because you are looking for a job right now. But... You know, take a night out for D&D. &D. Do it. Do it. Do it, Heather. Do it. Yeah. What else? What else is everybody else doing? Oh, yeah, work, home from, work from home jobs would be great for squeezing in some D&D. &D. Kids don't need you, right? I got Mark for that. Don't worry about it. They're they're pretty much independent at four and two, right? <laughs> um, I've been playing a little bit more Minecraft content editing. Oh, that yeah, that's what you've been trying to get jobs with. Um, uh, been playing a little bit more Minecraft. They had the Nether update recently. Um, I've, uh, found this really beautiful, like large open kind of half cave kind of area, um, right by the starting spot, uh, uh, zone that I was in. Um, and I managed to create a little home with the, um, we've, it's like it's up a level, excuse me. I've been drinking cider. That's going to happen. Um, and then there's, so there's stairs that go down to the strip mine, and then from the main ground area, there's a door that leads into the stairs, and that goes up into the, like, house area, and then I've dug into the hill to make this nice house, and everything's all blocked by trees and a ledge, um, and I built a sort of glass and cobblestone wall on the other side of the sort of cave opening. Um, it's kind of, it's, I think it's one of my favorite, like, little starter homes. Um, I haven't really done anything indoors. The, the biggest thing I've done is build a um, uh, storage cellar. Um, and uh, I've just been strip mining and fishing because we wanted to go to the nether. And I think that they... Yeah, this is regular Minecraft, Rick. Um, I haven't really played any Minecraft dungeons um, since the intro, actually. Um, George and I played a little, uh, like one night, I think, but, um, but yeah, we wanted to go see the nether. Um, and I think they sort of stealth updated the, um, difficulty on Minecraft for some reason, because I normally play it hard. Um, and we had to turn it down to normal. Um, and I know they said that technically the nether is supposed to be harder, but it felt like it was harder elsewhere as well. Um, and the nether is still pretty dang hard on normal. Um, and we realized we were not poorly equipped for it. We sort of rushed into it. Um, and so we have, um, taken a break on trying to get to the nether and I'm just trying to get diamonds and enchantments and things. Um, uh, oh, I've updated the stream. Look, the look of the stream a little bit. So... Um, right up here is a little follower's goal. Um, ooh, thank you, Heather, for following me. Brilliant. That brings it up to 12. I'm trying to get to 50 by the end of the next month. 50 is how I um, can get to affiliate status um, on Twitch and end up starting to earn some money. So hopefully I'll be able to get to that 50. Um, and um, let's see. To No, this way. <laughs> you can see the little chat scroller um, so that when I record this or, or save it for like YouTube, um, I don't have to um, waste time 
um, saying out loud what everybody's been saying to me in chat. It can be read right here. Um, and let's see. Yeah, the chat rollers, scroller is um, part of Streamlabs, um, so it's pretty easy to uh, get working. Um, uh, let's see. I'm going to switch to my other. So uh, right here where I am, this column um, is the chat scroller. And then it's also where like followers are going to get announced. Um, and then I put a little square around myself. Um, and then, nope, I got to get, it's backwards. So I got to get used to the whole backwards thing. There's the now playing. You can actually see it while I'm uh, uh, streaming a monitor. Um, so that's good. Uh, I'm going to continue make tweaking and trying different things out. I don't think I want to get too fancy. I don't want to be like one of those, um, you know, leap gaming streamers with all the blinks and the flashes and the bangs. Um, but um, I might, you know, even try designing something myself. I do dabble a little bit in the graphic design area. But if you have any comments or suggestions, let me know. If something isn't working properly, let me know. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback. Um, let's see. If you do have any feedback um, and it's not on a stream, um, feel free to DM me at Tempest TT Games. That's three T's in a row. Um, and Twitter. Um, I would love to take your feedback there. Um, please no death threats, though. I'm going to try really hard not to say anything that makes people send me death threats. It's kind of like my one giant fear about being anything resembling a public figure in any way. <sighs> um, let's see. Okay, well, actually... So this is my world-building show that we're doing um, here right now. Um, uh, I know I'm only doing like the one every fortnight at the moment, um, but this slot is generally dedicated to the world building. Um, once eventually I start doing more, what if, if I don't realize suddenly that what I'm doing is crazy, um, and I actually start adding more shows, um, this will remain the world building sort of my flagship, flagship show. And uh, not necessarily this time, but definitely Wednesday evenings will remain world building. Um, uh, specifically, the world that I'm working on is called Kinda. It's my homebrew world. Um, and it's sort of a D&D come agnostic TTRPG world. Uh, I don't know... I, I mean, I, I've thought for a while that it didn't quite fit D&D, &D, or rather than D&D &D didn't quite fit it. Um, so I was thinking about looking for other things, but I am tempted to actually create my own TTRPG. But I am drastically inexperienced uh, at TTRPG mechanics. Um, so I think I'm wanting to actually play a few more games before... I really try fiddling around. Um, I've been trying to read up on different dice mechanics recently, so I'm going to keep doing that before I start thinking at all about whether or not it's going to turn into a TTRPG of its own. Um, I primarily use, you can see this here on the left, I primarily used Scrivener to do my um, Morgan and Dragons. <laughs> That's so cheesy, Rick. <laughs> um, uh, I uh right, I use Scrivener to do all of my world building and uh GM bindering and all of that kind of stuff. This the one you're looking at here, um Scrivener is uh writing software. Um I got into it from uh my writing um and uh, uh script writing and novel writing and all the writing that I do. Um, it's quite nice. I really like it. It's sort of a, an outline and your writing content all in the same document and it's modular so you can move things around. I can take 
um, this document here and slide it up there or slide, well, I just um, put it under that one, but I can also bring it out there, move it around. And it's got, you know, each document has its own title and its own contents. And then when you want to publish it, um, it also does all the publishing stuff for you. Um, you can tell it what to include and what not to include. Um, you can, uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, and this view, when you click on like a bigger folder, it'll show you everything underneath that folder and like a single document so that you can, um, see the flow of things. Um, it's a great program. I really like it. Um, um, I've heard of some other DMs using it as well for, as their GM binder. And, uh, um, I think some people are getting converted. Um, it does cost money, um, but it's not expensive where I think they're about to come out with a new version and I want to say it's like 40 something pounds, um, or dollars. It's in their American uh, literature and latte, the ones who publish it. Um, just go to literature and latte.com. Don't take my word for it. Cause I don't know. Um, I bought it years and years ago. Um, there you go. Thank you, Rick. That well done. Look at you. Um, that's what mods are for, right? That's what I hired you for. Hired you. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Um, the, the channel in general. Um, so today we're just going to do work on the player's guide, but in general, um, I think I'm uh, going to start off because I've already got some stuff that I've been working on um, for the couple of years that I've been sort of adding little bits of information. I started something on World Anvil and then I moved it all here and then I've got like secrets and it's slightly disorganized. Um, but um, when Scrivener th uh, started uh, working on the beta for the new edition, um, uh, the beta, I started using the beta and it broke my old Scrivener 2, um, copy of my, uh, GM binder for this. Um, so I'm probably just going to start off like just transferring things between one Scrivener file and the next, um, and thereby take you sort of on a journey through my setting. Um, of course there's going to be a lot of creating stuff in that because, uh, I'm incapable of, of reading something without making more stuff up. So, um, there'll be that, um, all throughout, I'm sure. Um, and then we'll take it from there. Um, maybe there are specific topics that I might want to work on for a show. Um, I would love to hear your suggestions. Um, if there's like a general world building topic you want to explore um, through the lens of Kinda, um, that would be fabulous. Um, again, you can DM me on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, well, let's let's uh, let's start to get started here. Uh, I was preparing for this and thinking that I was going to do like a scripted introduction that I was going to use as a video for new players. Um, and then I was not figuring out how I wanted to phrase that and what I wanted to include with it. That is my big problem is it, with the setting that I, I know a lot of DMs and people in general have a problem with is what to keep out, what to include, how to introduce, introduce people. Just sort of Googling like how to introduce people um, I thinking that I was going to make a sort of a larger set of notes, um, from which to, to distill into my introductions. Um, and I ran across this here on the right of the screen. Um, really like this. Uh, the idea is to treat your introduction like a, a show Bible, like they use on television shows. Um, which a uh, show Bible is essentially a document used to focus the creativity of a collaborative team. Um, and what's 
an RPG except a collaborative team creating things together. Um, so I think it's a really good take on the subject. Um, I have looked at, um, let's see, uh, I found, this is their website. Uh, there we go. Um, I'm gonna send that to the chat. Um, they do a podcast. I'm a couple of Americans. It's a very good podcast. I've, I've listened to the last few episodes. They're really on top of things. They've had some pretty heavy subjects that they talked about recently within the TT, the RPG realm. Um, and they handled them really well, as far as I could tell. Um, they admit freely that they're, they're a couple of white dudes. Um, so, um, I think they are. One of them is. Oh, there I go, trying to load pages. I'm probably going to lose you at some point if I keep trying to load uh, web pages. Let's see. Yeah, that is a really neat bit of banner art there. Um, these dudes. Um, I think they refer to themselves as white guys in one of their podcasts. Um, but yeah, good stuff. Um, really like these dudes. And what I've heard so far, um, they have something like 30 years of experience DMing between the two of them. Um, and obviously not afraid to be humble, not afraid to handle the heavy stuff. And we've got some heavy stuff going on right now in the RPG world and the world in general. Um, let's see, let's go back. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of, there's some helper, you know, sort of like what's, what's a show Bible for dummies stuff on here. It's really good, um, really helpful. Um, I was sort of, I mean, I've kind of done, uh, I mean, I've written TV, a sh TV show before, so I have some concept of what this is already. Um, but if you don't, there's some really good explanations, things to be thinking about ahead of time. Um, but, uh, this is the part that, um, I started at. Um, so we've got two sections here. We've got uh, general information and player information. Um, and then some subjects to just sort of headline the document. Um, oh, I haven't worked on an, no, I haven't worked, written someone else's TV show. I've written my own TV show. Oh, totally not in that game. Sorry. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> um... Uh, it was, it's something that I, I've submitted to a few, uh, competitions back in the day when I was, uh, not stuck at home with chronic fatigue and couldn't write. Um, so it was about, um, it was about a, uh, graduate, um, a young graduate, um, who came home, uh, disappointed um, not happy with what she got her degree in, um, trying to find her place in a world with a very, with, she's, uh, she lives in a very middle-class family, um, and, um, she's sort of a, uh, just pretty typical millennial, um, in, in that she's just finding everything to be quite dissatisfying and, um, not living up to the promises, um, that were made to her. And, um, she uh is looking for jobs um and meets a uh dominatrix and um is just enthralled with the concept um and so she decides to become a dominatrix um and it's the show is essentially about with her coming to terms with her family, her very middle class British family, not having the same, you know, ideals as her um, and sort of having to deep dive into the things that her family doesn't necessarily believe in um, in order to be true to herself. Um, so it's a. Uh, 
uh, yeah, I thought it was really interesting to me, but it's uh, not easy for me to um, execute, really. Um, there isn't a lot of training to be had on writing TV shows in this country. Um, so, and I'm not very good at picking up on unspoken things. Um, so I, I had, I was taking it really slow. Anyway, yeah, moving on from that, it's, that was, that's a long time ago. <laughs> I'm doing this now, which is brilliant. I quite like it. Um, particularly because I can't imagine making any money off of it. So, <laughs> um, so I've got a sec, I've got a spot here to write in, uh, an introduction. Um, that's the introduction right here. Um, oh, maybe I haven't, I've included. Yep. Sorry. This is my spot for my introduction, sort of bullet pointed some uh concepts that i want to touch on in the introduction but i'm leaving the actual prose for after i've written the main content of the document um uh so it's a classic western fantasy setting fantasy setting with some twists um it's neither low nor high fantasy there's not really a term for that moderate fantasy sounds really boring um but uh the idea is that um there is not a lot of magic available um and particular kinds of magic are not available at all uh and it's it's touching on grimdark um but almost in a world in a world that sort of has suddenly expanded um so it used to be quite dark um, the lives of the humans who are the center of the story of Kinda. Um, and they uh, suddenly find themselves able to um, to do all the things that, you know, they couldn't do. So magic becomes a possibility. Adventuring becomes a possibility. Um, and it's all about that sort of cusp between um, the two state of oppression that they were in before what's called the elven exodus um and the um freedom the the lack of oversight um that they have as a species um and have had for the 50 years since the exodus um the setting is intended to be a living world um so each character is written so that um you can see them uh doing their own things so that you know what they're like when no one's around when the characters aren't around um uh themes um i got uh, most of the content, a lot of the content of this came out of me exploring the idea of themes and RPGs. Um, so this uh, setting um, has strong themes of trauma, um, epigenetics, rebuilding society from scratch, like I was talking about. Um, in the general information category, it's human centric. Um, I was previously just referring to it as the uh, human continent until I gave it a name. Uh, which is Wadaluna. So the whole world is called Kinda. Um, and I'm imagining that all of these names generally come from the elves because uh, everyone has forgotten what the humans called it. Um, so Kinda sort of just means world in Elven. Um, Wadaluna basically means human land. So it's sort of like Waddle is the human part of it and Una is the land part of it. Um, that's sort of my little um, linguistics touch on the setting there. Um, the So 
so far where we're at with the setting and where all of my campaigns have started with it is um uh is just it, it's based based on one of three of the elven city states um and um eight human lorddoms that are surrounding the state um yeah it's it's really interesting i i find it particularly interesting the idea of a completely forgotten past um the idea that that uh that there it's just it's almost a, a complete blank slate um there are characters who are particularly interested in recovering human knowledge um and human culture um so that comes into it um i just i like the idea of also just the discovery of of something that belongs to you but had been forgotten um sorry true elvish what heather what do you mean by true elvish yeah so there's a lot of that just trying to discover things and i think that works mechanically because it because that's what your people are doing. You what's what your players are doing when they play the game. So you kind of, um, I find that a lot of players want you to like tell them everything and anything. They don't either. They don't want you to tell them anything at all. And they want to assume that it's like do whatever, um, or they want you to tell you all the things all at once. Um, and so I like this as a sort of way of coaxing the players into. Uh, um, enjoying the spirit of discovery within the game. Um, oh, I have no idea if the language resembles any kind of Elvish from like Tolkien or it definitely isn't Tolkien. Um, I've just sort of made it up myself. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not particularly interested in emulating Tolkien, but, um, it'll be fun though to try and play with what I know about linguistics um in in trying to give the world flavor that should be interesting um okay so i wrote this up uh short history and timeline uh, the world you would be transported into is only 50 years old it is still essentially a social blank state for you to make your mark on 50 years ago the elves ruled the known world they had ruled the lands populated by humans for as long as their short memories could remember Illicit scholarship is to estimated the elven occupation to have lasted for two and a half thousand years before, one day, they seemed to disappear all at once. During the occupation, Wataluna's humanoid species were either subdued, eradicated, or went into hiding. Humans were rounded up and relocated to one of three elven megacities. They were enslaved, banned from magic use, and their histories were erased. Only the knowledge required for a specialized slave caste was able to available to it, and the many castes were segregated and compartmentalized. Again, if and if you um, have any questions about this, let me know because it might be pertinent and something I want to add to this. Um, so the lands not occupied by uh, by peoples were reverted to wild places, where the elves observed nature and conducted secret research. Since the exodus, Mimini cities, that's the uh, city-state uh, that everything is centered on, Mimini cities' humans and allies have begun to rebuild their own free society. After one or two false starts, Mimini established itself as a city-state ruled by a triad of organizations, the Farmers Guild, the Merchants Guild, and the Mimini military. The triad sent out eight new lords to establish eight new towns in strategic locations. Their goal to further a new human civilization. Yeah, very much a, a, an elven occupation. Yeah. Um, so uh, one thing you notice about my setting is whereas nobody is inherently evil, um, the elves are dicks. Um, they're, they're, they're bad guys. Um, they're definitely the villains. Um, obviously, there will be opportunities to to show that with more subtlety um and sophistications sophistication but um for now from the really simple base of this foundation of this whole thing the elves are dicks 
Um, the uh, um, halflings are essentially um, sociopaths. They don't just don't care. They don't care about anybody or anything. They're they're there. They're actually really close. Um, speaking of which, um, the geography and map. That's the next section. It says detailed map or quick sketch. I do have um a little drawing. Oh, I have a flow chart that I did. Um, as this was. There's not how do we there we go that's better um i did on scapel which is another literature and latte um, bit of software um so the, here's many mimini city down here and then you've got uh one two an eight of the lorddoms uh, mimini city is in the faceless mountains um, which is part of the crease, which is a sort of generally north-south um, uh, grouping of or of several mountain ranges that split the continent in half. And somewhere over here, are the ice dwarves. Somewhere over here is a city-state called Odevian, or was. Um, then you've got let's see, the Wold, which is where the halflings are for. Um, the halflings were not allies, they were subjects. Um, so the halflings were quite happy to be, um, uh, uh, dominated, um, subjugated by the elves. So as long as, as long as it didn't change their way of life, as long as they could, you know, grow their turnips and drink their beer and smoke their weed, um, they didn't care. Um, and so they were essentially, um, yeah, subjects on their own, living their normal lives. So the Wold is an island off of, uh, the continent, Wadaluna. Um, and somewhere around here is rumored to be, um, a hidden forest gnome town. Um, the forest gnomes refused to, um, bow down to the elves. They refused to stop, um doing magics that the elves didn't want them to do. Um, and so they had to go into hiding under threat of eradication. Um, then you go to the west. So there's a big river here that somehow didn't get on this. Okay, it didn't. There's a big river here called the River Timble, which is what the the uh, the village of Penaven is on the River Timble. Um, and that is one of the starting uh, that is the starting village for one of the campaigns, um, which is next to the town Nillenhold, which is a major uh, part of that campaign. Um, the names, see, I was going for sort of like a Welsh theme with Nillenhold and a French theme with Montmayeur, um, but I don't think I'm going to stick with that. It's a bit basic, <laughs> but no, a bit lazy. Um, so anyway, uh, Montmayeur is on the other side of River Timble, um, and further past Montmayeur, it's sort of right on the edge of the Kalanok Steps, which was a place named by a player. Um, a lot of these things are uh, that you'll find in this setting were introduced by players. Um, it's something I love to see them do. I love to see people contribute to my setting. So um, yeah, Kalanok Steps was named by a player. Um, it's very large grasslands, um, somewhere on the other side of which is the third city-state, Caliarax, which is on the edge of the Western Mountains, um, which is where the Fire Dwarves live. It's my little flowchart map for the continent of Kinda. I think everything else, all these other spaces are largely vast um, wildernesses, really. Um, uh, okay, let's see. Let's go back. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, sketch of the campaign world. Yeah, you're right. I, I would rather start with something that's bad than not have anything at all. 
Um, otherwise, you just get things like me calling it the human continent forever and ever, which I definitely didn't do. So cartography is limited to actual play um, for specifically for the player's guide. Um, emphasize things that uh, places where the characters might be from. So um, make sure that you're always thinking about how the players are going to want to engage with what you're presenting to them. Um, don't worry about stealing maps from other settings. Or what I did, draw a flowchart. Um, yeah. So let's see. What I wrote was, the campaign takes place in southeastern part of the continent. Um, okay, that was a bit of weird language there. I don't know how that as got in there. The southeastern part of the continent, Wadaluna. Um, at the southernmost end of the crease, nestled in the faceless mountains, lies Mimini City. The river Timble leads from somewhere high in the faceless mountains out to the sea. On the east bank is the village Penaven. The west bank is a marshy delta that leads to an expansive grassland known as the Kalanok Steppes. The region just west of the river is known as West Timblin, where the town Montmeilleu it was established in the foothills of the mountains in order to rebuild the bridge over the river to Mimini City. East of the river is East Timblin, where you will find Nillenhold crowning um, a crescent bay, crowning Nillenhold crowning a crescent bay, half a day's ride. Oh my God, that's really wordy. I'm going to have to fix that. Uh, let's, let's highlight this mother. Where's my highlight? There it is. Here we go. Okay. Reword that mother. That's no fun. Um, Dillon Hold is essentially, um, on a Crescent Bay, which is half a day's ride from Penaven. Uh, Dillon Hold was built to establish sea travel. Uh, the town has no plans, has plans for no less than three shipbuilding docks. East Timbland and the lands that stretch northeast from it along the coastline are mainly forested and wild. Six more lorddoms have been established somewhere within those forests. Uh, in other parts of the continent, it is known that Odevian is the northernmost elven city, somewhere to the east of the north end of the Creest. Also in the frozen north, and somewhere to the west of the Creest, is the Ice Dwarves Glacial Stronghold. The last elven seed city, Caliarax, lies somewhere on the western edge of the Kalanok Steppes, in the foothills of a mountain range, which includes the volcanic stronghold of the Fire Dwarves. Off the coast of the final northeastern stretch of the Eight Lorddoms, a sizable island called the Wold is the home to the halflings. The Wold is only just visible from the mainland on a clear day when the seas are calm, using a well-made spyglass. It is whispered there is a hidden forest gnome settlement somewhere either on the Wold or the mainland nearby. Relationship between the dwarves and the elves. Um, so the dwarves have kept to themselves. I would say that the dwarves are um, uh, a civilization, perhaps the only civilization that would have been capable of bringing the elves down. Um, so the elves did not provoke them in any way. Um, and the dwarves... Uh, are too busy with their particular um, culture um, to worry about what happens to other species. Um, they follow... Um... Oh, I'll get to that. It's, it's sort of a religion thing, but I, I, will, I will get to that. Um, let's see. What else? Um, picturesque. I'd like to think so. I'm a very visual person, so sometimes that's why you get weird wordings like this, because I have an idea in my head of what a thing looks like. Um, and you'll see from my um, notes as well that I like to actually draw a picture of like the first person view of things in order to help me use it in, um, in a game, um, where instead of 
I think I, I may have described this in the intro where instead um, I uh, of writing a description of a new place, I'll just draw a picture of it and then I'll describe it off the cuff from that picture. Um, you'd like to holiday in Nillenhold? Why? What, what sounds holiday worthy in Nillenhold? The Crescent Bay? Yeah, I suppose it's quite lovely. Just the words Crescent Bay, though, that does sound really nice. It reminds me of uh, what they say is like the mu most beautiful phrase in the English language Language is, is cellar door for some reason. But I think I like Crescent Bay better. Yeah, water's good. I'm definitely a very water-oriented person. I don't know if... I've, I've pretty much spent my life taking trips on water. Um, I grew up in Chicago, which is on uh, one of the biggest lakes, lakes um, in the world. Um, and so in my mind, I've always lived seaside. Um, because it's just, it's so big and there's loads of beaches and you can barely see the other side. And, um, there's lots of lakes and rivers in the area that I grew up as well. So I spent my whole life canoeing or speedboating or fishing or even when we took trips to Alaska where my aunt lived for years and years, um, we'd charter a boat. It was family tradition. Um, no matter which part of the family was visiting to charter a boat and go halibut fishing. Um, I, I hold the family record by the way, 65 pounds. My, my grandma held the record before I broke it. 55 pounds. What a great old lady. Um, but yeah, I've always had an affinity for water. I was a swimmer. I swam competitively in school. Um, I kind of, I would, my, my favorite idea of a holiday is to, is a flotilla holiday. That's my secret wish is that I could get convince my partner to, um, take a, um, naturist flotilla holiday with me. That sounds amazing. It also sounds like skin cancer, but I'm all for it. <laughs> um, let's see. Next thing. I think, I think that's kind of all I want to say about geography. Um, let's next bit is important places. What do we have here for important places? Um, gazetteer. I don't know what the reference is there when they say gazetteer. Um, you should list and describe some of the places on your map. This should include the place where the campaign starts. Include centers of power, commerce, and learning, as well as dangerous locations and places where treasure could be acquired. Um... Hmm. Uh, where would you start with that? Start with Mimini City or start with Penaven? Because I have multiple campaigns. Uh, or rather, I have one that I've done twice with different groups of people. That's the one that starts at Penaven. Um, and then I have... Um, uh, Another campaign that I've been wanting to start that's a, a sort of spy campaign um, that uh, is centered around Montmeilleux. I can't, pardon my terrible French accent. I don't really don't know why I thought that was a good idea. Um, there is no one center of the action ex throughout all of the campaigns. So... Montmeilleur is the center of the spy campaign. Benaven is the center of the the other campaign. Um, I, it, perhaps for now it's best to start with Benaven because I still haven't quite finished the spy one. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's say Benaven is the village in which players 
shall begin. Uh, ooh, it's uh, okay. So it's it's not a new village, or it's not an old village. It's a new village. Um, begun from a um. Refugee camp. Naven is home to Wadaluna's only half elf community. Okay, that's good. Not too much detail. Even though all that stuff is rumbling around my head, this is really hard. Um, let's see. Waterloo is only half elf community. Um, once Mimin, uh, Mimini city was established, uh, Penaven was eventually folded into the civil structure. But as an independent, um, what do you call it? An independent, um, doop -doop -doop. village, we'll just say village. It is an independent village. Um, let's see. Um, the people there live a quiet life um on a an in, on a small peninsula above the river timble where they are self sufficient they have only just opened the village to um to outsiders uh um I mean, yeah. after digging out a uh what do you call it it's a road that goes up into the side of the peninsula. Um, sort of like a little serpentine road. Um, uh, I know I've described this before. Let's let's go look at my other notes. Uh, let's see, East Timblin, Benaven. Oh, that is NPCs, all right. Locations, Benaven. Small hamlet set on a hill cliff over the river Trimble. Trimble, that's not right. Oh well. At the bottom of one side of the hills, ferry. Well, that's important. Um, River Trimble is border of lands. Lot, land is rocky and wooded on the other side. Not good for anything but raising goats. Uh, uh, side of the hill on the edge of the village is the Cross Hands Inn. The road goes to the ferry. See, that's an important thing about Penaven, um, is that a lot of Penaven's wealth comes from the ferry. Because um, when the elves left Mimini City, um, they tried to burn it down, uh, on the way out, um, and they didn't succeed, and, but they did succeed in ripping down the bridge that crosses the gorge over River Timble. Um, so there was no way to get from the east side of River Timble to the west side of River Timble until, um, until they built the ferry and Padaven. Um, and so that is essentially their bargaining chip in 
maintaining their independence from the general sort of civil structure of Mimini City and um, the outlying lorddoms um, is the fact that they um, operate something very important that people need. Um, Montmeilleux's ta- So each of the lorddoms was given a task. Um, so the one just past Nilnhold, I think I've decided, is is farming. Um, so non-magical farming, because prior to this, the only way, the only place to farm is in these like sort of catacombs underneath Minnie City, which required quite a lot of magic use. Um, so um, in establishing the eight lorddoms, um, they established one that's job is to learn how to farm without magic. Um, Nil and Hold's job is to establish um, sea travel. Um, Yes, in a way, they are rediscovering agriculture. Um, uh, They're rediscovering pretty much, they're rediscovering a lot of everything that anyone ever does, ever. Because as, um, while each slave caste had a particular task, um, so there was a slave caste specifically for shipbuilding, um, they didn't, they weren't given all of the tasks of shipbuilding. The elves maintained a lot of secrets um, to things that sort of were the linchpin for uh, groups of information like shipbuilding, like how you make a ship. Uh, they they would hide bits of information or they'd separate the information out to different sections of the cast. So one cast could only do this part of making the ship, and the other cast could only do this part of making the ship. And the two casks, casts didn't intermingle. Um, and then the the like higher artisan level of things was always done by an elf rather than a human. Um, uh, uh, so in agriculture, there's, um, you know, in every area, there's always something particularly important to being self-sufficient, um, that no one was taught. So they're trying to discover a lot of things. Um, yeah, I suppose it is a bit like medieval guilds. Um, but again, because we're post-Exodus, not everyone, they don't organize themselves this way anymore. Um, whether that's because of rebellion or because they thought of doing something better or, or whatever. Um, there are some people who sort of still honor those, that caste system in a way, um, because a lot of it, there, a lot of them were related to people within their caste. Um, um, a lot of, there's a lot of family ties within castes. Um, people were identified, um, by their caste name. Um, when it was necessary for them to um, uh, uh, intermingle with people of other castes. So um, someone might have the name Stan, but um, in being referred to or in speaking to someone from another caste, their full name would be like Stan Shipwright. Um, And... uh, uh, yeah, so uh, seeing as farming was done largely with magic, um, they don't hold all of that magical knowledge. Magic is one of the, the most restricted forms of information um, out there. Um, and um, if not for the farmer's caste, humans wouldn't have any magic at all. Um, in fact, they're not supposed to have any magic, um, in the first place, but the elf that ran the, um, that operated the farming, um, in Mimini City for hundreds of years, um, taught the elves, illicitly taught the humans how to do certain kinds of magics and therefore, um, so earlier I mentioned that Memini City is run by a triad, including the Farmer's Guild. The Farmer's Guild doesn't actually represent agriculture. The Farmer's Guild represents magic. So that is actually the name of the, uh, of the magic using guild, um, in this setting. Um, 
so yeah, they had a lot to do, a lot of work to do with agriculture. So there's a whole lorddom specifically on agriculture and probably what they consider to be the most arable land in the area. Um, and also be sort of central to the other eight lorddoms. Um, let's see what else. So Penavin had the ferry. That's important. Um, let's see. Uh, good Lord Guntav is the uh, leader of Nillenhold. Is um, Deuxième is the leader of Montmeilleur. Um, oh, that's a little bit about the sort of struggle. There's there's burgeoning conflict between Montmeilleur and Nillenhold um, that I originally wrote into, and I'm not sure how much I want to keep that. Um, that might be something to get rid of. Um, uh, and that's a little a little dispute that Penaven ends up being in the middle of because they're in the middle of the two lorddoms. Um, yeah, because to me this is just a bit too high fantasy for this setting. This whole conflict, war tax... Um, I think right now it's still just a bit feud. It, it's more of a sort of family feud, I think, is as far as I want to take it, really. Um, but I do like the idea that that um, there's something brewing on the edges of, of the consciousness of Penaven. Um, whereas they thought they had spent the last 50 years getting comfortable with the the fact that the elves were no longer there, the fact that their lives are no longer, um, that, that no one's coming to kill them. Um, they're no longer refugees. They've settled the land. They're trying to be self-sufficient. Um, and I, I like the idea that just as they're starting to maybe relax, they've just invited outsiders they now have a little market and a tavern and stables. Um, there's a bit of conflict brewing on the edges that is maybe that they're smack in the middle of. Um, and that uh, that sort of risks that sense of safety that they have. Um, let's see. Townies, unusual heritage. Let's see a fairy, cross hands in northern wood. That's the word. Yeah, I think I think it should it feels maybe it should feel to the players like war is brewing. But that's not actually what's happening. I think war is a bit much for these people that like Heather says, um, they're starting without any history at all. Um, they don't know what war is. They've never had war. They literally have no concept of war. Um, it's, it's like locking a kid in a room for 18 years and then setting them out in the world without anybody to help them. You know, they might they might have some idea of how things work, but they are completely alone and completely inexperienced. Um, and they have to try to work together. And uh, so so they don't know what a war is. They don't know. They have some general idea of how to like work with people who are in charge of different things um who are independently capable but in the case of this particular conflict um guntav's uh what is it let's see so lord guntav and lord Duziem both have children who are of marriageable age um, they had decided uh, that they would sort of promise them to each other, um, from a young age, 
Um, but once Guntab's daughter came of age, she refused to fulfill the betrothal. Um, and Lauren Guntab um, sort of supported her in that. Um, these are all, you know, really sort of kind of simple, obvious sorts of things. There, there are people who are used to, like, people being planned to be together um, for, you know, breeding purposes. Um, and, uh, however, so, so Lord Duziem was not happy that she refused his son. Um, and so there's that conflict. They, they, it's sort of an escalation. Um, and what I had put on here is that Duziem attempted to kidnap Guntiv's daughter. Um, but failed, and the plot was uncovered. Um, and so Guntav is on the brink of, well, I suppose he doesn't know what to do about this. Like, how do you... How do you solve this problem? I think... I think it's natural for Dizium wanting to just sort of kidnap the girl. Say, well, it, you know, possession is nine-tenths of the law, right? Um... But how does a, a man, how does Guntav, how does a leader decide how to react to something like this? He's, this this other fellow leader has attempted to kidnap his child against her will. Um, but he has to consider um, diplomacy, which is also a thing he doesn't know anything about. So I think there's there's definitely I mean there's definitely going to be some false moves and some sort of childish behavior um but I don't know if I would make it war but it should feel like war I don't know what that looks like what does that look like tell me what that looks like um okay let's see Crosshands in Northern Wood, Finney's Marsh. Finney's Marsh is important to the campaign. Um, it's um, a seaside marsh just uh, south of the city. Um, I've got... I wonder if I should include a map on this. Yeah, I think... Um, let's see. I'm going to get out my map out there is ugh I have too many tabs open my taskbar cannot keep track of them all I've had to open everything for fear of uh losing you all on the stream while trying to load a web page or something Campaigns and toolkit, kinda, images, maps. Here we go. Okay. All right, let's find, let's go back to this one. And we're gonna drag from my folder, or we're gonna move it under important places. Yep. And now you can see It will load. Load, load. Mysterious disappearances. Ooh. That kind of overlaps with the first adventure. Um because the first adventure, um, the first, the, the reason you come to Penhaven, um, is because, um, of the rumor of cultists. Um, and you start to notice pretty quickly, um, that there are children missing. Um, but that has to do with something else. Not exactly the war. Come on.
There we are. That's that's the map of Penaven. Um so you've got Finnish Marsh down here and this the coastline sort of curves this way. Um that's the river, the ferry, north woods. This is the sort of top edge, the cliff edge of the peninsula that goes around here. Um, and then the road, which again, I can't think of what, what would you call this kind of road? Access road. <laughs> Access road. Okay, let's see. Um, someone is stoking the conflict. Who would, what kind of person would have a stake in that? I wonder. Who would have something to gain by fomenting, um, I love that word, fomenting, um, conflict? Elf loyalists? That's not a thing. Totally not a thing. Maybe a thing. Hang on. Uh. Okay, so. I don't want to give the impression that anybody, especially as identified by their species or larger culture, that anybody is all the same as everybody else in that species or culture. So um, when I say that the humans started the city state and uh, agreed to move and create, move out and create eight lorddoms, I'm talking about just sort of the general populace. Um, however, during the at after the exodus, um, there were lots of splinter groups. Um, there were people who were sure that the elves were going to come back and they would not leave their um, cast homes. Um, there are people who had already escaped Finaven and were part of um, rebel, uh, rebel um, cells. Um, and uh, so now they're sort of these people with a cause who have nothing to fight for anymore. Um, then you've got people who, um, who there's, there's a large group of people who lit literally had no skills except breeding. Um, there was very much a breeding caste. Um, they didn't feed themselves. They didn't dress themselves. They didn't make anything. They literally were just pampered pregnant people um, and pampered studs. Um, and I think that these people feeling that, that definitely some of these people feeling that they didn't have a purpose went out and they created their own um like i don't want to say villages way waypoints stops along the way along the road between the lorddoms where they provide services um to people traveling um there are little tiny communes uh where um They want nothing to do with society or culture, like in the middle of the woods, they're just hiding out. Let's see. Um, yeah, mysterious alternative cultures that exist outside the... Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly it. They're like alternative cultures. Um, there's definitely a lot of these are going to be essentially bandit groups. Um, people who decide, you know, fuck it. Rules don't matter. Nothing matters. Um, and, uh, so they kill and steal and all the things. Um, in fact, one of the lorddoms, um, 
was actually taken over by a particular group of bandits um, fairly early on in the beginning of the eight lorddoms. Um, the, the lord that was sent out to one of the lorddoms uh, was not able to hold the lorddom, and so the bandit leader um, is now the eighth lord. Um, yeah, so there's all, everybody had different views, you know, there's, there's lots of little minority views on how, what should be the result of the, the elven exodus. Um, uh, digging out an access road. Uh, let's see. So we want to talk about, let's mention, um, the inn and the market. And even now, um, boasts a large, um, in the crossroads in. Yeah, I mean, I think it would definitely be described as sort of a cold war, maybe. Obviously, if they're not fighting, it's not a war war. It's something else. I'd have to, I run into this a lot when working on the setting is sometimes I have to reverse engineer an idea in order to figure out what suits the setting because everything is coming out, is coming from nothing. It's sort of amnesia, as Rick put it. Um, so uh, when it comes to how Lord Guntav is going to react, I think I need to sort of step myself back how would a person react? How would, you know, what are, what are the thought process behind it? I think that's, that's definitely a session for sitting down and thinking about that. Um, I, I once reverse engineered frontier towns in order to try to figure out like how, how did Nillenhold work? Um, how big was it? Um, what, what stage of development was it, is it in like what things were going to be worked on in what order? Um, yeah, I don't know if that's necessary in, in setting, in world building. I'm sure that a lot of people would probably tell me that I'm trying too hard, but fuck them. Um, I, I, this is how my brain works. Let's see, the Crossroads Inn. Um, Nebo is a large inn, a market street, um, and even a small half orc camp, which is one of the features of Penaven. Um, orcs were thought to have been completely eradicated. Monstrous races were thought to have been completely eradicated. Um, and, um, then one day while Penaven was establishing itself, um, some half orcs showed up with their tents, um, and, and worked out a deal with the village. And so they, there's, there's like a little, little orc city. Um, I think it's on my map. I know it's on my map. Down here, this little bit. That's the orc encampment. Um, they're, I mean, orcs are a nomadic race from the steppes, from the Kalanok steppes. That's sort of my lore on orcs. And uh, half orcs uh, were considered an abomination similar to half elves being an abomination to the elves or at the very least half elks half orcs were enough orc to be worth killing um because i think it would be fair to say that um the elves hold certain um truths um in 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 their minds that um there are races there are species that are inherently evil and should be removed from the earth, which as we all know, we're all mature enough now 
to recognize that that is wrong and evil in itself. Um, so yeah, um, there are probably a couple actual orcs in this encampment, um, but it's mostly half orcs. And they get along fairly well with the half elves, with the citizens of Penaven. Um, it's just that they're a little bit uneasy with the idea of fully moving in. Um, let's see. Um, I don't like that phrase, though. I think that doesn't encompass it enough. And even... And even now boasts a large inn, the crossroads in a market street. Uh, I'm going to get rid of that. Boasts the crossroads in a market street and the only known half orc encampment in the world. That's good. Okay. Um, what else does it want us to include? Centers of power, commerce, and learning. Dangerous locations, treasure. Um, the village is run by a council of nine, nine members of old families old it's not old isn't the right term of the original families from the refugee days and a Mayor um and an elected mayor who almost always is the eldest no the head of the family maven who also run the How's that for politics? Is that is it a good? Uh, a good sort of summary of does that bring up any questions? It'd get that fairy back in the, onto that list of important features. Oh, that also also need a unique chapel um chapel of the nine Yeah, I think that fairy is really key, economically speaking. Um, there are other major industries in in Penaven, which are more of sort of byblows rather than being as key to the story as the fairy is. Um, so there's the goats. Um, now, if you know anything about me, you know I love goats. So I have to include goats in my setting, obviously. Um... So, so the hills to the to the east of Penaven um, are prime goat territory. Um, so there's a lot of goat herding. Um, there are some people who boast um, the name Goddard, um, who are traditionally the goat herders of Penaven. Uh, goats are hilarious. Yes, they are. They're brilliant. They're hilarious. They're smart. They're annoying. They're just fun. Goats are the best. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, then there's also some, um, there's an iron trade, uh, bog iron, 
um, that they get from the marsh. So there's a family that specializes in um, retrieving bog iron from the marsh, and they also do a fair bit of um, um, uh, uh, like precious gem uh, mining in the side of the hill. Um, April 4th? <laughs> How are we April 4th? <laughs> Uh, let's see. I also run the Penavan Ferry. Okay. Um, so that is the political, that is the civil structure of Penavan. I just don't get the reference. I'm sorry. I'm not as much as a Harry Potter nerd as you are. Okay. Is that even a Harry Potter reference? I think it's a bit deep cut Harry Potter if it is. <laughs> okay, let's see. So we've talked. Uh, yeah, so there's the Chapel of the Nine, um, which is unique for reasons that we will get to. Um, Half Orc Encampment. Yeah, that says that says enough on its own. Um, okay, maybe we should. Yeah. Okay, let's try. Um, there's also lots of fishing because there's um, sturgeon in the river. Um, there's a lot of sturgeon fishing. Okay, it is a Harry Potter reference. It's some naughty things with goats. Where did you get that from, Heather? Heather, you've got a dirty mind. You're not teaching that to your children, are you? Poor kids. <laughs> oh, you're poor kids. <laughs> His patroness is a goat. You know way too much about this. <laughs> Heather writes fan art for Harry Potter, by the way. <laughs> or fan art. Fan fan uh, fiction. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, important places. Um... Nearby, nearby, and even is the um seaside lorddom, um, uh, which is what is the phrase like seat of power in an area? So we're talking about Nillenhold as the town that. <laughs> Oh, that's a quote from, wow, which book? <laughs> I think, I feel like that's something Dumbledore would say just because it's funny. Rather than it actually being true. Because, I mean, I feel like Dumbledore is too nice to, like, badmouth his brother in front of people. Goblet of Fire. Okay. Oh, Heather, is that the first time you've heard that? That's that's how she's being referenced now. She mu who must not be named. That's that's how it's being done. Actually, I think it's appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, turfs. Um. Okay. Uh. So nearby Penavent. No. Uh, Penavin is within the Lorddom, because well, that's generally how it's seen. Penavin is within the um, Lorddom, ruled by the town, ruled by 
uh, and hold no. For which no, I see. Yeah, this is hard to type. Nil and hold. This is what I get for naming these things funny. Um. Uh, Nillenhold is in fact named after Guntab's wife, Nillen, which is a Welsh name. Uh, Nillenhold is the seat of power. Nillenhold lies on the a crescent bay. Uh, um, prime for future C water based economy. Um, what would you call that? Commerce prime for future C commerce. Uh, Lord Gun Guntav. Uh, was assigned the task of mercantilism. Ooh, mercantilism. What a good word. Uh, let's see. Lord Guntav was assigned the task of um, shipbuilding on behalf of the Human and by half of humans, um, half of the humans. Yeah, I think that's right because it's mercantile mercantilism. Yeah, that sounds. That's. I think that's the right spelling. On behalf of the humans who once lived in Mimini City. There you go. Um, doing for time. It's getting almost ten o'clock already. Um. Okay. What are you gonna do? All right. I genuinely thought I'd actually get through this whole thing in in the hour and or no forty five minutes. I'd set myself to do it. Hour and fifteen minutes. I'd set myself to do it. Which is ridiculous. I don't know why I thought I'd get it all done by then. So we're just going to keep working on this. I think for now, I think I'm going to flesh this out a little bit more um, on this important places section um, on my own. And then we'll work on the next bit in the next thing. Likely this could take us through several shows, I think. Um, yeah, I think I had to explain a lot of stuff to you in order to... Because uh, cause normally I, I probably, without thinking about it, run through all the same stuff that I had explained to you in my head before I write stuff like this. So it makes sense that uh, that we had to go through it and went through a lot, of, touched on a lot of different things in order to do just these little bits of things. Um, I'm talking in, in like stuff and things phrasing right now. And you notice it's gotten really dark um, while doing this. Um, we are losing the height of summer now, which is unfortunate. So I'm going to have to think of, uh, oh, I forgot to introduce, this is my study. Uh, last time we did a show, I was uh, in my lounge um, because that's where my Xbox is. Um, I'm sorry, Rick. I know it's mean. Um, but yeah, it's we're we're over the hump of summer. Um, so I'm gonna have to sort out a lighting situation earlier than I thought I was going to. Um, because right now I've just got one tiny little um halogen bulb right over there, and obviously my screen, which this doesn't really my screen makes a fine key light. Um, but the little halogen doesn't make a very good fill light. Um, so I'm gonna have to figure that out. Um, cause obviously as the sun goes down, it got really dark. 
And now I look a little bit like I'm, well, I am sitting in front of my computer in the dark, which is a pet peeve of mine. I have to always turn on the light in my partner study because he likes to work with the light off until it's suddenly dark and you have to remind him that it's dark. And he goes, oh, um, anyway, um, yeah, I think, I think that's good for today. Um, definitely check out this blog and, um, take a look at this, um, campaign, uh, Bible uh, PDF that they made. That's really good. Uh, try out Scrivener. Um, I really recommend it. Um, yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm really excited. I think we're probably going to spend a lot of time going over grounds. That's not new going over old ground, which is fine with me. Um, it helps me solidify things. There's a lot of stuff I haven't thought about that doesn't quite work with my current idea of of what kinda is um so i'm going to be changing a lot of that stuff stuff like the the war between um good to have and dzm uh so that'll be things that we can work on at a later time once we're done with the player's guide um and uh yeah i think that's downloaded a demo of scrivener yeah good good um, if you need any help figuring out how to use it, let me know. I'd be quite happy to help and give you tips. Um, this is my, I have a, I have built my own, um, blank, like template, um, which is quite different to the way it starts. It starts off really bare, but I've built my own, um, structure specifically for RPGs. Um, and I'm still sort of tweaking. That's why I have it open. I'm still tweaking it. Um, because I've introduced the player's guide. There's a player's guide section and a campaign section and a template session. And then my library, which is literally just lore. Um, it helps to build those kind of templates in Scrivener. Uh, let's see. Is there anything else? Um, any, do it, um, do either of you have any tips for um, introducing settings to new people, people who haven't heard about it before? I think, Rick, you, um, you've been working on a sort of player's pack for your setting, um, which includes some of the supplements that you sell on DMs Guild, by the way. Check out... Um, uh, Rick's supplements on DMs Guild um, under Grizzly Eye. Um, great stuff there. I've been playing his campaign for a couple of years now. Coromelons, conflicts, mysteries. Yeah, it's definitely been like two years. It's kind of scary. Um, stop photos and stuff. Okay, so. Um, because it's an RPG, um, it traditionally speaking, everything is described, um, orally. Um, I do, however, use photographs for reminding myself of what the setting looks like, um, uh, of what, uh, so in my, in my GM binder, there are photographs, um, let's see, actually, I might be able to bring some up. So this is my old one. We're going to close lore theory, one of adventures and one of the adventures. No, it's not that one. It's justice. Um, and it's herb. Yep. It's herb. We'll get that to load. Um, so, uh, in, in my village, um, if you piss off Penaven, um, at any point, they will put you through a trial, um, in which each member of the council has, um, a little task for you. Um, this particular, uh, member of the council, Herb Silverskin, um, is, um, uh, 
is has actually um is dying when you meet him um his partner flynn Gracken um is a forest gnome uh the only gnome that you'll run into um for a long while at least um he actually is uh responsible for um keeping the refugees safe before the exodus um and he is an herbalist um he actually runs the shop herbs herbals uh or herb and um they are this cute like elderly couple well one of them's dying obviously so they can't be that cute but um i like the i love I, I really romanticize the idea of sort of the older um, gay couple. I, yeah, I love it. I think it's adorable and I wanted it in my village. Um, yeah, thank you. I really liked that as well. I think it gives a good flavor to Herb and his pedanticism that he would spell it that way to make sure that you pronounce it that way. <laughs> um, I have a couple of really cute names for all the different Places in my village, actually. Um, Cobble says, keep them short and punchy. Yeah, um, I get why Cobble says that. I think he uses, because his settings are so high fantasy. There's there's a lot of sense of um, uh, uh, if you can think about it, it probably exists in his settings somehow. Um, but on the same time, he also has a tendency of playing with players that he's trained himself. Um, so he he writes his player guides for people who, or people he's been playing with for a really long time as well. So he writes his player guides for people that he knows, how, that he knows that they know how to get more information out of them in, inside the game. Which is a thing that I think a lot of established players that you don't know are going to not understand and not know how to communicate with you about. Yes, high fantasy kitchen sink. All the monsters in the monster manual. Exactly. That's, yeah, that's exactly what Colville does. Um, so let's see. Okay, so, the, he, so Flynn sends you on a scavenger hunt. Um around the village and this is sort of like an interesting way of getting to know the village um while also facing impending doom um and so i've put together little sort of um uh, mood boards um about different parts of the village so this is the woman who uh you who is ostensibly the leader of the village um then there's um, different um, bits and pieces from nomadic grassland tribes and in the world that I've used to help describe what they have. Yeah, mood boards are great. Um, lots of sort of native indigenous. I really wanted to stress the idea that they feel like a very native indigenous people um, who have been displaced. Um, so they've got that sort of um, whole ground baking um and it's seaside so there's lots of fish it's a really common um indigenous co cooking method um <clears throat> and um let's see and then images from the town square so this is sort of like so each it, it, scavenger hunt is um you're given a clue you have to go so the first clue is you go find this woman uh well the clue's more complicated than that um Let's see. Yeah. So there's riddles that you're given to identify um, where you're supposed to go next. Um, Celtic, eh? I was thinking sort of maybe Mongolian. Um, sans horses. Um, but I didn't want to... I'm wary of cultural appropriation, so I didn't want to draw too strongly from any one thing. I wanted to give the impression of a nomadic indigenous group of people um, without specifically referring, referring too strongly to any culture within the world, um, within, you know, our world. 
Um, so then you meet this woman. That's where the clue leads you to this woman in the orc camp. And then the next clue leads you to find this flower in the tavern square. Tavern square is the name of the open grass area in the middle of town because it's where their first tavern was, which is no longer standing except for a door. Um, and, and a little girl runs up to you. She's got dirty feet. Their um, people are in the tavern square preparing for some kind of holiday, which I haven't come up with yet. Um, and then that then takes you on to the ferry. And this is one of my little first person drawings you can see in the background here um, of the ferry dock. Um, looking out over the river, sort of the wide part of the river. And you've got like foothills to the faceless mountains here. And then to the left is the, um, grasslands and the Delta. But, um, I wanted to emphasize sort of, um, muddy beaches and boats and, um, sturgeon, um, cause that's the major fishing trade. So I think you, um, at one point you're introduced to somebody who's a fisherman who's in the middle of gutting a fish when you meet him. Um, which I, I had so much fun describing the first time I did that because I mean, I've done this, I've done fish cleaning before and it's not pretty. So I, I, I really had fun grossing out the players when I described that they were like, wait, what? I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah go on steal it um yeah all of these things have meanings and make references so um founders grove um is in is in the woods to the east it's where the original refugee camp was um and then there's just it's sort of this is sort of like a view of how what it would look like and then there's a river on the edge of the woods and then there's bees. Um, and this is another first person drawing I did. So yeah, I mean, I include lots of stock photos and things, but um, the problem I have with it, with stock photos is mostly that they're not quite right. They're never right enough. And I also don't want to give people such a set idea that they're always depending on me to tell them exactly how things are in the world. I want to give them just enough information to um to express the feeling of the place and I, and let them fill in the blanks um so yeah this that's what this is for this is to let me cuz i have connections that i make to these photos and i want to um i use them i use my connection to them to use the words that i want to give and then let it, and then everyone else makes their own connections to them so this is, this is on the cliff side. There's a little bench with some grasses and you can see the Delta from on the cliff side. Um, the first person road, one of my first little drawings I did of the sort of access road up to Penaven. It's really bad though. <laughs> I have to work on that one. Do that again. Actually, no, I have been working on that one with some trying a different um, line drawing technique that I've never done before. Um, yeah, too much does become sterile. It becomes too, it becomes not alive. I think that's why I want people to make their own connections because if they feel like they have some kind of ownership to it, you give them space to feel like they belong there, then it'll be alive for them. It's too easy to, to take away that space. Okay. Um, I think we need to wrap it up. Um, yeah, I think it was good. I think we got a lot of done. We covered a lot of ground, talked about a lot of things. I'm going to have to work on the whole thinking and speaking at the same time. I'm not good at that, but, uh, we'll get there. We'll get there together. Yeah. Hey. Okay. Well, y'all have a really good night. Thank you for coming. Thank you for chatting with me and listening to me ramble on. 
And um, in two weeks, more of this, more of working on the player's guide. All right.